and welcome to episode 152 of The Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast focused on the latest decks, trends, and strategies for the casual spike. My name is Stanislav here in Chicago, and with me on the line from uh, hold on. Denver, Colorado. Oh, yeah. It's the one and only... Wait. It's Shane Beeps. I oh, mean, I'm so glad we had last week off because... This this one this is this is a marathon of an episode. There's so much to talk about, so much going on in the world of magic, and I'm glad that I have Stanislav and Stanislav only <laughs> to talk talk about this stuff. Wait, what? So Shane, I, you know I hate to embarrass you, but uh, we do have another co-host here. Oh, it's the Godfather. Oh, that's what that rectangle is. That's right. It's Dave Harbarger. I'm a rectangle. <laughs> you're the fridge i call you the fridge i always baby. thought of myself as more of a pentagon or something like that well i mean on my screen you're a rectangle but in life you're more of a pentagon you have a very square jaw mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's the beard it's a beard trimming it's really curved that's my weak weak jaw that i keep hidden <laughs> under my beard <laughs> guys are you feeling fresh i'm feeling fresh after taking last week off this bit is really hitting so good right now i know exactly <laughs> where it was going <laughs> goes down smooth just like a rectangle goes down smooth i mean we did we did have a bonus episode get recorded and released but that was only me and that honestly uh kyle and josh are so easy to to chill with that it, w- it wasn't even effort not like you two you know where yeah we do have higher expectations than guests do for real but this is a special episode stan right this is a very special episode this is another fan favorite long-awaited Patreon request show. Beautiful. Perf- perfect timing. Heck yeah. This one is thanks to one of our top tier citizens of the Dive Down Nation, Mickey S. The other Mickey S. Yep. One of the Mickey S's. We have many. This is Mickey S. This is the Mickey S show. So big thanks to Mickey for your ongoing support of the Dive Down. And this week, Mickey asked us to provide an in-depth metagame analysis of his favorite format, Best of One Historic. Mickey S plays so much best of one historic. It's like you, every, every time I go on the historic channel or I see what's going on, Mickey S is posting some wild screenshot with always has like 75 permanents on That's the battlefield. Right. <laughs> and it's always, it's always, he's like, Oh, where, Mickey, how are you doing? He's like, I'm like mythic 500 <laughs> NBD. <laughs> NBD. Mickey loves to win big with crazy brews of his own. He'll put Yori on in any deck or he'll just try to storm off with any combination of permanents. Some beer gee going on these days. I heard. Yeah. That's right. And, and I got to add a very timely request because we're going to kick off the show with a look at the results of the weekend's player tour, which also featured a historic portion in addition to standard, which we're going to ignore. <laughs> Good. Of course. Yeah. And one more for you. We're going to react to the recent alchemy announcement and the impact of this news on historic's future as well. And we might have a little touch of modern to talk about too off the top. So stay tuned for that if you're if you're interested in that too. Stan, uh, Stan has some stuff to share. That's what that's a little foreshadowing. Yeah, I actually have a bone to pick with Dave. So stay around for that. We love bones. We love bones in the breakdown. That's right. But listen, if you want to be like Mickey S and work on an episode of the Dive Down with us, the three amigos, all you have to do is join the Patreon. Be a top tier member, and you too will get this privilege twice a year. We love doing these. It's super fun. They're challenging. They're enjoyable. They sometimes take us outside of our comfort zone, and they're always good episodes. So join us. The water is warm. So speaking of the three amigos, who is Martin Short? Who's Steve Martin? Who's Chevy Chase? I was just going to ask the same question. <laughs> it's kind of sad that I had to confirm that that Chevy Chase was, in fact, the third amigo. I, I was drawing a blank for a minute. No, I had that on lockdown. My dude. Stan, have you seen this movie? Stan's Martin Short. Done. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I want to be Martin. I th- Shane is Chevy. Yeah, is, yeah, Dave, are you Chevy or am I Chevy? I'm too nice to be to be Chevy, Chevy yeah, Chase. I think, I think you're a Steve Martin. You're right in my mind, Dave. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll take Chevy Chase all day, every day. I wonder why Chevy Chase wasn't in Murders in the Building. Only Murders in the Building with Martin Short and Steve. I don't know. Maybe that's on another podcast. We know. You know why. They wanted to get that. They wanted to get that area on a ground. No, we, we know why Chevy Chase isn't anything. Anyway. Anyway, thank you again, Mickey. We hope you enjoy this episode. Everyone else, stick around. 
because we're about to get into the best part of every show. That's housekeeping. Shout out to the newest members to join the Dive Down Nation in the last two weeks. Nicholas R., Vera A., Jose P., Jim C., John G., Aaron G., no relation, and Cora B. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, new citizens, for joining the Dive Down Nation. We also have a new review from Biscus. Uh, so glad, Biscus, to have another Chicagoan in the Dive Down Nation. Uh, we're also really glad we could push you to finally make your own modern deck. So thanks for the review and thanks for listening. Awesome. And if you'd like to support the Dive Down podcast, you can check us out at patreon.com slash the Dive Down, where as little as $1 per episode will get you access to our definitively discreet Discord server. Come and hang out with everybody online where we talk about things constantly. Too many things to list. We have things, we talk about our things, and we talk about talking about our things. And if you'd like to support us, not through Patreon, but do it while playing Magic instead, you can go to manatraders.com and use code THEDIVEDOWN2021, all one word, to get 15% off your first two months of a rental service for uh, Magic Online cards. We use it to play modern. Check them out, manatraders.com. Stan. Dave. We got kind of a grab bag of a breakdown this week. We had a couple things to talk about, but I think the first thing we wanted to do while we're here before we get deep on historic is talk about modern for two minutes because Stan and I actually went to a paper magic tournament today. My first one <sighs> since March of 2020. The deck I registered in March of 2020 had once upon a time in it. That's how long ago. And that's a good card, Dave. Did you did you do it on this one too? I also had once upon a time in this one. It turns out free spells are still great. <laughs> you didn't get deck checked. It's all fair. Yeah. So, Stan, what do we do today? Dave, we top aided the Dice Dojo Store Championship. You're cutting right to to the results. I mean, what else are you going to do? You're going like, to talk about your round-by-round round experience on this episode? No, we are not. No, we are not. Stan and I somehow both top aided this uh, 28-person tournament. And congrats, Stan, you came in second. Thank you. Yeah. And congrats, Dave, you came in eighth. Fifth through eighth. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know what. There's no numbers there. It's just fifth through eighth. You know. That's right. Uh, it was good. I, I do have a bone to pick, as I said. Mm -hmm. You walked off with my soul guide lanterns. <gasps> I sure did. <sighs> Those are valuable. Do I have to go to the suburbs now to get them back? Yes. What I did was I left my soul guard lan lanterns in your car, so you'll have to call me back. You know what? Can I add one other thing to our great results? The top eight featured a third Dive Down Nation member. Oh, that's right. Cam K. All right, Cam. Way to go, Garfy baby. Uh, what were you guys on? So I was playing Prowess. Maybe not to surprise anybody. <laughs> oh, man. What Given kind? my last year. Boros? Well, the flavor of prowess that's around these days that I had liked was uh, a list that Doomwake has been playing. And I also think, saw that Caroline Cavanaugh actually played yeah. uh, in uh, in Denver in one of the store championships that she went to. Oh, yeah. Carolyn did? Yeah. I think she also made top eight. She did. Yeah. Surprise. So I took, I, I was playing Doomwake's list. I took some stuff from her sideboard or really, I just, I added, I added a pithing needle because I was a little worried about Belcher. Probably a good thing to worry about as it turned out. But, um, so the red prowess deck or red splash white prowess deck that Doomwake's been playing. If you haven't seen it, check them out on Twitter. It's basically the cards you would imagine, except it has a prismatic ending in the main and you're playing uh, Chandra Dress to Kill, which mm, actually mm -hmm. I didn't really get to play today. I, oh, no. I don't even think I drew it in many relevant situations, maybe in one game, but uh, it's been very good for me online. So it's a card that I definitely like a lot. And the main reason I picked this one over like a mid range kind of red deck, which I was also thinking about, was I really, really wanted to play Prismatic Ending. Honestly, and Prismatic Ending, still a star, always good. Always good. I played yeah, spells. Okay. I played this deck online a bit as well, Dave. I, I only did one league with it, but pretty quick four one in the league. Um, I agree. Chandra's awesome. Really powerful card. I think one interaction that we didn't necessarily acknowledge when we were analyzing her during the spoiler episode is that her plus one both creates the mana and enable spectacle on light up the stage, mm -hmm. Ooh. which feels super powerful when you line that up. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great a great play to be able to just drop. And your deck is full of one drops, so being able to cast your Chandra and then plus it and drop an extra threat or lightning bolt something or, yeah, in the best case, uh, light up the stage. It's it's good. I think it's really solid. What were you playing, Stan? 
I was playing Teamer Rhinos. So you just ran it back? I ran it back. A slightly different version than what I played in Vegas. This one had four no rhinos. main deck. <laughs> well, you know I side out the rhinos. Side them out, yeah. Uh, no, th- this one had four main deck Blood Moon, um, which is some new tech that's been showing up in MTGO results in the last week. Um, and prelims and leagues, I was really impressed with it. Been doing pretty well with it in, in my own leagues and testing. And decided to run this out. Yeah, I was going to mention that's also part of the reason that I liked playing a red deck right now is that I really wanted to play Blood Moon. Just feel like it's really good. And so Stan and I were both kind of on Blood Moony decks. How relevant was Blood Moon for you today? Uh, it definitely won me a match that I played against Grixis Shadow. I feel like it kind of put the nail in. It definitely picked, uh, you know, bought me enough time in one game against Hammer. So I think that was also good. So I, I would say Blood Moon was really good. Yeah. Even though I didn't get any of the kind of like wombo combo matchups that I really have it for, which are, are uh, amulet, uh, elementals, stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. I, I actually cast a Blood Moon in game one against Amulet, which was my quarterfinals opponent in the top eight. And it lost me the game because I did the rookie mistake of running out of early Blood Moon so I could blow up two Urza Sagas, which felt very important because they were about to... Get, get to amulets. Get to yeah. an amulet. Um, but then I couldn't land a threat, and then he just hard cast Titan and, and yeah. ran me over. Yeah. yeah so what what do we say? Disruption without a threat. I know it was it was just like I can either two for one them and then hope I draw enough lands to cast the fury that was in my hand. Right. Spoiler alert, I did not in that game. Right. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I still won the match. But otherwise, nice. you know. Blood Moon, it, it did feel good and relevant. It was a little awkward in, in my first round opponent in the actual tournament where they cast a Blood Moon against me the turn before I was going to try to cast it against them. It was I was up against Ponza, but... Surprise. That's magic. And Stan, you, you took it all the way to the finals. You played, What did you play against in the finals? I lost to Belcher in the yeah. finals. Um, Ooh. Really, really fun games. They were very fast. But it was very much like Exhibit A of what people either love or hate about Modern, where game one, you know, I got myself into a position where I was able to flash in a Brazen Bower to present lethal damage. And my opponent had a Pact of Negation, which they cast on my Bower, and then they won at instant speed with a Belcher in response to the Pact of Negation trigger. Rough. And then game two, I had double Leyline of Sanctity against them in my opening hand, which I got down, and they immediately force vigored it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> dear. Yeah. And that's, that just felt like very modern problems and very modern solutions. Yeah. My day was a little strange in the sense that I got a round one bye. Yeah. I was this person. It was a 30-person tournament. I got a round one bye. I won round two and three. Then I drew round or lost round four and then drew round five to get into the top eight and then lost lost the first round of the top eight. So that means if you are really counting, I went two and two. I just had my two wins in the right spots. Mm-hmm. But you know, at a tournament that size, it's good for good enough for a top eight still. Yeah, I want to add one of the other highlights of this tournament, I think for both of us, was at the end or the middle of round five when, you know, you and I were basically in tables two and three, and everyone starts doing like the napkin math of, can you chop here? Like how many points does it take to get into top eight? Mm-hmm. What are the results of someone who got paired down over at table five? And that was really fun. And we were both able to draw into top eight, which yeah. feels like the hallmark of a truly good player. Sure. <laughs> yeah, like I said, two and two made top eight. Not sw- I didn't sweat it at all. Yeah, you know? I, I was three, one, and one. My one loss in the Swiss was, again, to Cam. Yeah. So Dive Down Nation came in pretty strong today. Cam, Cam and I chopped in round five, and he and I both got in the top eight as a result. Sweet. So, good good job, Cam. Good job, Stan. Good job, we Dave. Got a bunch Medium of, we job, got a, Dave. Uh, we got a bunch of like photos and stuff in the Discord this weekend of people who finished in top eights. We had two folks here in Denver uh, finish first and second at the, the Mythic Games. Uh, store championship what's one of the stores that i will frequent now and then i guess that's infrequent now and then but uh i know cora and shark both uh, did well this weekend here yeah i also know aaron won his store championship in portland 
I think, at oh, the yeah. Mox Boarding oh, yeah. House, Portland. Yeah. Am I yep. am I right? Yeah. So. No, totally right. I, I actually believe three Dive Down members made the top eight of that <coughs> eight-person <coughs> tournament. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> I'm not sure yeah, that they were at the Mox Boarding House, but they were all together at the same store. Oh, okay. Portland. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. I mean, it was great so, yeah. to see everybody doing that. It was a fun, fun thing. For some reason, it seemed to capture some energy for people to go and go and do that. So that was that's that's great. You know, we're getting live updates that it was the one in Sherwood. I don't know what the one is. Some kind of store, <laughs> Mox Boarding House, like uh, Robin Hood's Merry Men. <laughs> Someone's garage in Sherwood that has a that's a WPN premiere <laughs> store. Congratulations, you two! Uh, great work, rep- repping the nation, uh, having a good day. All right, so that was that was fun. The store championships were fun; they were real fun. Uh, <laughs> shame, but we had some wild stuff happen this week in uh, in Magic. Did we not? That we have to talk about uh, for a minute. Oh dear, there's so much. A, mi- a minute. I got so much to say about this. I really just hope it doesn't take like 45 minutes. But uh, so this last week, Watsy had a state of the game presentation on Twitch. A series of articles on the mothership. So, guys, what are you thinking about this new Playblade we have in the Arena client? The new, the new what? <laughs> the new Playblade. What's a Playblade? Uh, just it's the UX of how like we select what mode we're going to play. Oh, okay. In all seriousness, they made it. That is one of the announcements, but they made they made a pretty major announcement that's going to impact the way people play Digital Magic, or at least Magic Arena, probably forever. And that is Alchemy. And what Alchemy is, is a new arena-exclusive format. It's ostensibly based on standard, the format itself, and incorporates these new-to-digital cards alongside rebalanced standard cards, including already previously banned cards that are back, to create a new experience, new format for arena players. It's Mirror Mirror, right? It's the Mirror Mirror event that happened a couple months ago. That was the the testing ground for this idea. I, I mean, we it, this is the stuff that's been really transparent, right? I mean, we'll talk more about I think like our takes on this stuff, but this is this has been stuff that we have seen, hinted at. We have looked into the void and said, "We know what you're doing, Watsy. We know what you're going to do. We know what you're going to do, and you did it." And so, this is just kind of designed to be a. I think they use the words like fast, frequently updating experience for Magic Arena. And like I mentioned, it's not only kind of rebalancing cards. Like I think some of the ones we saw was like a rebalanced Omnath, uh, nerfed Asika's Chariot, uh, nerfed Alrune's Epiphany, uh, a nerfed Luminarch Aspirant. No, not Luminarch Aspirant. What's the one that puts the 1-1 counter? That's in it. White? Okay. Luminarch Aspirant. Beautiful. And we're also- I'm not a- sure they nerfed Chariot, by the way. I gotta be honest. They did. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's 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 kind of a sideways juke more than like a direct nerf. A, a redesign. You can, you can definitely call it a redesign. Yeah, they're they're interesting. I think it's interesting to look at the cards. Like, go have fun looking through that gallery. But let's let's talk about what our reaction was and what the what the reactions, what the world's reactions were. I mean, we're also getting importantly sixty three new digital magic cards as well in this format. Uh, you know, those digital play mechanics, we've seen them tweak before. Uh, players can expect more new cards alongside every standard set release, they say. I will note, uh, it only, there's really, really only about 80 cards needed to make Pioneer playable on Arena, but go on. Wait, for real? I was like, in terms of cards that actually see play, yes. There are people who have done the numbers. Uh, really, about 80 cards are all they would need to make uh, Pioneer a playable format on Arena. Wow. Okay, let's get on that. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> All right. Yeah. I, I. I didn't. I didn't realize this part of the announcement until you pointed it out, which is that digital cards with every set release. So they're going to have digital only cards that relate to the theme of the sets they're about to release. I guess, or they, that they are releasing in standard. So it's sort of like every standard set's going to get this adjunct digital only set. Yeah, and it does. It, and yeah, and you can buy it, Dave. You you can buy it. Why not? Uh, so yeah, we're getting an, an like an Innistrad Alchemy packs that will have these new to new to digital cards. There's some kind of dupe protection in there type thing, but just know that it is a a new way to spend your hard earned gold or gems on Magic Arena. So there's going to be like these two versions of standard side by side, and sure, if you can pick between them, if you play standard. But importantly for our podcast, the digital only Alchemy cards are, of course, historic legal. And the rebalanced cards are replacing 
their old printed versions as well. So I mentioned Luminarch Aspirant. You see it a lot on the ladder. It's a two mana human, puts a one, one counter on a creature you control at the start of every combat step. This alchemy rebalanced version puts the counter at the beginning of the, the end step, the controller's end step. So that's the version that's going to be in historic rather than this paper version. And that's the thing. So that's basically will be the, the fact that there is no alchemy historic. There is only historic. Mm-hmm. <sighs> okay, go on. <laughs> yeah. So the incentive here, ostensibly, is to be able to continually balance magic on arena via card nerfs, via card buffs, which is what every other digital-only CCG, I mean, that is popularly played as far as I know, has already been doing this, right? So this can, of course, potentially keep formats balanced. It can be used by WotC to keep formats interesting through ongoing adjustments. I think that's something we can talk a little bit more in our pros and cons section. But it adds more digital-only cards in Alchemy, the, the Alchemy Innistrad set, and and further ones, of course, to these formats. An interesting choice as well, because it's also adding more new variables and more new options to the alchemy format and historic beyond just using these uh, existing cards and the adjusted cards. That's a This is a big deal, right? Like historic has just always been a strange collection of cards. And of course it has included these recent jumpstart digital only cards. And it's, but it's still been like, you know, 98% analogous to the paper cards that we have had in our collections. We have passing or deep familiarity with, um, and if something was too powerful, it just got removed from the format via a banning. Mm-hmm. Or suspension. Or, suspe- <laughs> or suspension, yes. Mm. But now <laughs> it is subject to the digital massaging that Watsi is going to be applying to alchemy. And importantly, to standard alchemy. And so that's just sort of going... I mean, I'm curious about something that would just be... This is too bad for standard, but it's fine and historic. And then it will kind of maybe be nerfed or something like that. But that's something we can take as, as, as it comes. Right. So I think we have to talk this over, right? Like what are the pros? What are the cons of yet another huge change to digital magic? And which in its own way is a change to magic itself, both immediately. And then in the future, this is really mind bending, right? To me in a lot of ways, it was just, there's so many little pieces of this whole thing. Hey. Yeah. It feels like a turning point. Like we've seen the path that got us to this decision. And I don't know if this is the exact conclusion that any of us anticipated, even though maybe we could have anticipated bits and pieces of it. But this just truly feels like what they imagine the future of the digital game is like. So let's start with the pros before we get upset and fight one another. All right, you go first. Which pro? What's your pro? Stan, if you want to be Mr. Positivity. I I did not volunteer for that role, but I, I, I will say maybe on the bright side, this is a turning point for aggressive action during unfun formats, especially unfun digital formats, I think is probably the, important to specify. And and really just a willingness to update cards more frequently if something becomes overpowered rather than being in the type of situation that I think a lot of standard players are talking about right now with Aurens Epiphany that you know we might remember with Pioneer a year ago or so. You know, obviously sometimes WotC is aware that changes need to happen and historically those changes have always been bans but now they had this new tool to make adjustments on the fly that can potentially salvage otherwise you know experiences that have potential to be fun or let people play with cards that they want to play with that they couldn't otherwise because they were pushed out by other overpowered technology yeah i mean i think that they kind of had to do this at some point in some sense because they have a digital platform There's a lot of people who play on this digital platform. Standard gets solved really quickly these days. And I've seen people say this a lot of times. And they're all like, you know, standard gets solved so quick now. That's what makes it not fun. It's not that the cards are more broken than they used to be necessarily. or That they're worse at printing answers than they used to be. It's that there's so many people playing. How does that theory sit with the two of you? That that's the problem, perhaps, with unfun formats is that people just solve them too quickly. So... Stan, Dave, I know we we just launched the bonus episode, and so I don't know if you've listened to this, but the... Shane, you launched it while we were at a Magic tournament. I know. So no. So I would encourage everyone, one, to listen to that episode, because it's 
I, I thought it was really good, but not because I was on it. I barely talked. It's because we weren't on it. That's why he really is <laughs> yeah. encouraging you to listen. Well, they ha- Josh and Kyle had some really good thoughts about what makes card games fun. And even though they're like, I think fairly casual players, like they definitely have played, they've played arena. They have a history of magic, but I think that they don't play a ton is that they were very astutely were saying that the game is designed to be solved now. And that's everyone's goal. And it's not about like being surprised by opening a cool card in a pack that you've never seen before. It's not about sort of discovering interesting things for your, with your friends. It's not for us that I think it might be for some people, right? I don't know if it ever was even. So I think that it always was designed to be solved and be competitive. But I think that especially in the world that we live in and the game that we live in, it's, it's, it's a problem to solve rather than kind of like a, a game environment to have fun in. And so that's kind of, I, I, I agree with this idea that we are in a game environment that gets solved quickly. And this does allow WotC to, rather than just release new cards, to then say, hey, this is going to be a fluid environment in which you will solve new problems. And if that's the game you enjoy, you'll have more opportunities to do that. And I think some people really like that. And lots of digital games work like this now. I mean, part of the reason that I didn't get into Legends of Runeterra was trying to keep track of some of the adjustments that happened and figuring out what the ramifications of those adjustments was a little bit beyond what I could like maintain my attention span on. You know, and I, I know that they do weekly adjustments to card power, right? Depending on what's going on or they have the potential to. I do think they try to have more of a paced cadence Mm -hmm. than that. And I think that they want people to sort of have a, like respond to a schedule or have an expectation on when these things will happen. But yeah, I think they, they do happen frequently. And I was kind of getting at this before as a kind of a, a pro is that I think that it does allow people to have something to look forward to. Because there's so many heroes, right, in the game and so many kind of uh, major characters, like mythics, more or less, or legendaries type thing, where it's like, hey, uh, my favorite hero has not been doing great, so maybe they'll get a cool buff. Yeah. Or maybe or maybe like a nerf in this environment will allow my deck or the type of deck I like playing to be viable again. So that might happen here, too, you know? Yeah. I mean, for better or worse. You're right. This notion of the game is designed to be solved. I understand where it's coming from, but first of all, I think this is the nature of any competitive game, right? We're not playing Dungeons and Dragons, which is a actual sandbox where you're just on an adventure with your friends, right? This is a game about winners and losers, largely, and you know, opponents present problems for one another to have to solve through a variety of different ways. That said, I think we would agree, though, that modern may be solved insofar that we know what the best decks or the best cards in the format are. But surely you would agree that the modern metagame, even with the same card pool that it's had for, like, you know, basically since MH2 came out, has been cycling within that environment without necessarily the addition of new cards, just as people, you know, try to outgame one another and the evolutions of the format. And the best decks today aren't necessarily the best decks a month ago or a month before that. Yeah, I mean, I think the problem is uniquely acute to standard is really what what Shane is kind of saying and where this whole thing comes from is that standard gets stale because there's not that many cards in it. You know, there's, you know, I mean, there's 1,500 cards in standard. Do, do, do you think that's true, though? Like, ju- just because of the finite number of cards within the format, you can't have that much churn? Yeah, I don't think that you get the, the kind of met, rising and falling metagame shares any as much as you maybe did at other eras of standard and you know if you look at standard tier lists of decks and things like that there's typically like five decks that are playable or less where modern has so many different things that it's just that's just not what it what it's about so yeah i think being able to tweak it is is that's great for standard we don't really pay a lot of attention to standard but at any rate like i understand the problem they're trying to solve they want to be able to get more money and more interest without having to design more cards all the time and i think that's fair yeah I mean, and it lets it lets developers do what other digital CCGs are already doing, and that's being agile. Yeah. Like if a mistake's made and something's too oppressive, like tweak it and see what happens. And that keeps people engaged without necessarily outright bannings. And I think if it's done thoughtfully, like it can keep a game environment healthy without invalidating like an entire deck concept. And we, I see that a lot in other digital CCGs where it's like, hey, Pirate Warrior is a 60% deck. And we're going to nerf the one drop to like make it like a 55% deck. You know what I mean? It's just, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I think is 
good and I think can happen a lot. And I, I will say, I, I think in the experiences I've had in other digital CCGs, nerfs sometimes do make decks pretty bad, but some, I think more often they do just a correcting element. And if WotC is able to make someone's decisions to like spend 10, 15 wild cards on a deck feel still okay and not really stupid, then that'll be a success. But I'm less confident in that. Yeah. Let's get off of this point for a minute. The, the one thing I wanted to talk to you about just, I think that letting magic evolve digitally like this does open up a lot of design space for people. You know what I mean? For the, de- the designers there just to do interesting things, stretch their legs, see what kind of concepts they can bring to the to the table. You know, I'm not a huge fan necessarily of decoupling digital magic from paper magic. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, just because of what I want out of magic in general. But I do think having some venue where they can show what magic looks like without being bound to paper is interesting in that sense too. Yeah. I, I think this might be a nice transition into what we see as potential cons. Yeah, there's at least there's a lot more to talk about here. Because you know, David, to what to your point right now, you're saying that this opens up design space, but this could also perhaps give them free reign to break cards with an you know escape clause, like if something's so bad, we'll just nerf it. And if people spend dollars or wild cards, then they might be you know out of that cash without any recourse. Yeah, like how how far can we push this, and and then we can just tweak it in post, but yeah. they do have the paper environment to, for, to worry about as well. Like they can't, they can't just be going ham like, Hey, we can, we can fix it digitally. And then they'll be like, well, we have to ban it in paper. And like, they don't want to, they don't think they want to go back to the hugely unpopular, like just ongoing paper bans that we experienced for a few years now. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Some of that has gone away at this point, but I, I don't think they want to do that either. Um, but again, the mo- the bigger context of that is mostly mostly around standard. I think that there is a lot of problems with not giving people an option to get off of the train if they want to get off of the train when a card's been tweaked. Mm-hmm. Maybe there. I feel like there should be some kind of remuneration for people to be like, okay, you nerfed Alrin's Epiphany. I get a one time chance to say, do I want to turn it back into yes. wild cards or not? Yes. Or I, I I don't know how that mechanic should work, but it does feel unfair because what's going to happen is, and I've seen people talk about this in Slack, that they're going to be like, they're never going to ban anything anymore. So yeah, what they're yeah. going to do is just tweak everything until it's unplayable, and then you can't, you never get a chance to get out. So I, th- I think you do you do need to give people a chance to like, if they decide the deck's not for them anymore because of a tweak, do something with that money. I I think I mean that that's the thing that seems the worst to me about this in some ways, at least in the context of the overall system of what di- of what arena is. Yeah. I mean, can we just talk about how this, this just isn't an option for historic? Like that's just the biggest issue for me here. Right. Is like this it, historic is now just a different format again. <laughs> again, I mean, yeah. then and we, and we've seen this trend happening and we weren't super keen on it in the first place, but it wasn't like the digital cards have dramatically changed historic. I think there are some that are very good. Yeah. Uh, I played one this week that I'll talk about, but I, it hasn't been like, it hasn't felt like, oh man, uh, there's the discover mechanic in an arena, uh, every game. It's like never, never, almost never happening. Right. Yeah. But it's, this is just like, it's, it's just what historic is. And that's a, it's a pretty big change. It's like we, the paper, the paper cards, the link to paper is further distressed here. Yeah. And I hate, the fact that they're splitting arena completely off from paper magic, at least as far as we go being, you know, non quote unquote, non rotating format players. Yeah. I mean, that I think that's the big point for me. You know, when we look back on why we started exploring historic in the first place, I think it was a combination of a, this format's really popular. People seem to really like it. Let's see what the hubbub is about and maybe expand our own horizons as players and podcasters. But I also think that we are the type of players who have an affinity for non-rotating formats on principle or just conceptually. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really a signal that historic is not really meant to serve the purpose that non-rotating formats have where, you know, a person can have a relationship or an identity connected to a deck where, you know, you could be the blue-white player or you could be the burn player I think it's really hard to do that when the format is 
changing so drastically and the cards will sometimes change frequently and it becomes harder to really, you know, dig your heels into something that you like. And and especially if they're going to add cards, not just at the same rate as standard sets, but more frequently because they create these like historic mini packs, mini packs, supplemental products, anthologies, uh, spell books, mystical archives. It's just like historic is now just a thing where if you want to compete in historic, you really have to be willing to invest often. Yeah. And, and, and be kind of be willing to pivot and sometimes By design. At your expense. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely a problem with it. The bigger problem for me is just the type of player that I, I am, you know, is that I, a good player. <laughs> hey, I top aided today with a two, two record, two, two, one record. Um, I, uh, Look, what I want out of magic and digital magic is to, I don't get to go to the store a lot. You know, I get to go to paper tournaments, like, I don't know, four times a year, realistically. And, but I like to be a part of the community. I like being part of the Slack and being able to talk to all the people who are LGS people. I like having a little bit of like familiarity with the players around Chicago that show up. Some of that's through the podcast. Some of that's through just popping up at wherever every once in a while. But in order for me to feel like I'm still an okay player, I like to be able to play digitally when I'm home and I can't uh, you know, go out to the, the LGS. And I like the format to be the same format that I'm playing <laughs> online versus I'm playing in paper with people. It's like, I, I ultimately, I do want part of magic to be a paper experience an in-person experience. And yeah. arena is just going so far away from that right now. And that's yeah. what I find really to be a bummer because I, you know, I love modern. We talk about modern on here. We're all back on, on the modern train over the last six months. It's been a great format. I, you know, we'll talk about that another time. I would love for arena to have something like that as well a non-rotating format that is in paper too. So I can have a little bit more of that harmonious experience, you know? Like, yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like I'm playing modern on magic online, but if I could play modern on arena, that'd be pretty sweet. I mean, potentially like, you know, the, there's a lot of the, the option of the leagues, the option of the uh, actual stakes on, on magic online is, is a benefit as well. But yeah, of course. We'd, we'd like to be able to play a, a, a legitimate paper format also on Magic Arena, I think, because that's the kind of players we are. Shane, what do you think? I have I have a plea that I'm going to make at the end of this, but you you go ahead and... I've, I've got, I just have so much to say. I'm glad that the two of you have said a lot of it already. <laughs> but for me, it's just like Magic has been transitioning into like three, like basically four buckets of money. Magic players have been sort of being placed into like four buckets of, of income for Wizards and like the first bucket, I think, is like arena. It's like digital players putting their money into this captive arena system, and they might spend money on gems to draft or to buy packs to keep up with standard, or even better, to do what we're doing, which is buying anthologies, buying remasters, buying jumpstart sets for historic and to keep up with historic. And interestingly, of course, these digital-only cards for alchemy standard and for alchemy-based historic also forcing players to spend more money than they would have had to spend just on the standard stuff as well. So that's the first bucket. Second bucket is like like people like us, I would say, like invested, like quote unquote, serious paper format players. And I know that EDH can be very serious, so just forgive me there. But it's, you know, primarily, I think, modern players. Like they figured out how to make us pay for Modern Horizons every two years to keep up with that format instead of just picking up a few cards a set and then, like, the third bucket is, like, I think the invested ca- casual paper format players. Again, Commander's but, not casual. Yeah, let's call it let's call it Singleton. Singleton, players. Singleton yeah. Legacy, and Vintage is sort of what, what we're talking there, which is, like... I mean, I would just say, like, yeah, just basically, like, I mean, they, they make different cards for those players. Like, they make EDH-focused cards. Uh, so, just a, different, just a different pool of cards altogether. People keeping their deck, decks updated, making new decks. And then there's the kitchen table players, quote unquote, that make up a surprising amount of the player base. And they have buying habits I can't even speak to because everyone knows that I'm a whale. Uh, and so they're just going to make decisions to maximize the engagement and then profitability of these players in each of these buckets that have the least amount of impact on the other players. And Arena right now is like so segregated from the paper format players or at least paper format environment, that they can make whatever decisions they want in that area to keep players engaged and to keep them dropping cash into the ecosystem. And 
note that my mention of, of spending money on this game is not like me bashing wizards and bashing Hasbro. I think that's like a, a necessary thing to keep having resources to make your game. Sometimes it's the best part. <laughs> but the real issue for me is what you said, Dave, which is like, I want, I wanted my digital environment to be just a different way to play my paper cards. Yeah. And maybe that format was like just a little bit funkier. It was a little bit more annoying to keep up with, but like, it sort of felt like the same power level had somewhat similar strategies I could play, but it's just not going to be that ever. I mean, I also hoped at one point in time that Historic was just going to be a paper format, that they're going to go, ah, oh, Pioneer didn't work. Let's do Historic instead in paper. We'll print a master set, and then everybody will know what's in Historic, and we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> and it. That's not happening, no. No, it's, just, it's yeah. just getting more different. It's just getting yeah. more separate, and it's just sort of putting up the, the, the format wall a little bit higher. And I think some people are going to be fine with that, and many other people are not. So kind of What's your plea, Dave? What's sort of your, your bottom line, I guess? I mean, I think this is something that's been inevitable. As we said, as magic grows into a digital, a true like Arena grows into a true digital product that has l- much lower enfranchised players than Magic Online does. Totally understand that. I don't know if we should fight that part too much, like let magic be a digital game in some contexts. Let that be fun. I think that's fine. But... Please make Arena have a space on it somewhere that leaves space for people who want to use digital as a way to get better at their paper game, is my plea to Wizards. And so what I'm saying here is, especially given what Shane said a little bit ago about Pioneer, is I know you in the press conference or whatever, they were like, oh, we haven't thought about Pioneer in years since we promised that we were <laughs> going to put it on there. <laughs> make the 80 cards on Arena that Shane is talking about that make Pioneer a viable format and put Pioneer on a, on Arena. That's This is what I'm asking for now. I don't want Modern on there. I don't. It would take too long. It'd be too hard to get there. I mean, I'd love it, but it, they're never going to get there. Probably not. Not with the way they're going in the forward direction. Yeah. Please put please put Pioneer on, on Arena, I'm saying now, so that I can use it. Because I'm not going to use it too much right now, I don't think. One last question for you guys. Yes. Do you think this may bode poorly for people like us who may be predominantly paper or predominantly modern players right now? Ostensibly paper modern players. Or yeah. are, or are you like me where I think we might actually come out all right if our you know motivation is to mostly remain modern aficionados? I think what it does for me, I'm not going to like draw any lines in the sand to be like, I'm done with historic. I'm done spending money on arena, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to, I think it's premature to say that. I think what it does is this turns me off at looking at historic as as a serious format at all. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not sure I ever really did after the mystical archives. I mean, it's not, it's never been a pro tour or any, uh, it's been been like (laughs) a set championship type thing. Right. I mean, I just I, I after the mystical archives I think that was maybe the the thing where I was like okay this this is an off the rails format this is like just whatever they want it to be add some stuff see what happens but I mean I still might get like a wild hair and play like a few dozen matches with like some aggro deck once in a while but I'm what I'm really worried is that it further removes us and most of our listeners from like caring about historic as a serious way to play magic and it's just sort of like a fun way to mess around with digital cards when like when we have time on our cell phones like we're, we're waiting for the bus or we're in the restroom or something like that it's just like a discouraging it's kind of a discouraging way for me to think about like hey we're having this historic focused episode uh but i do feel like watsy kind of forced our hand or at least my hand here to like think about how i think about historic i weirdly think maybe not so weirdly i feel like this is sort of to me i hope it's a clear indication that magic online is going to be around for a long time (laughs) Yeah. Because for a while I was kind of like, is this just going to die? And remember when (laughs) Arena started and everybody, like there was a huge crash in the value of cards and stuff. And now I'm like, people, I mean, it's a smaller, much smaller group of people that plays Magic Online versus who plays Arena. I'm sure the numbers are vastly different. I I wouldn't be surprised if it was less than 20% of the people who play Arena play Magic Online, maybe less than 10% play. But it does make me feel like they're going to continue to support Magic Online and keep keep having it be there. Uh, I hope that there are ways that we can fix the economy there. 
because that's probably unsustainable in the long term, the way things are working out at the moment. But um, yeah, it makes me feel like modern is going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. I think they know that modern is their most popular paper format, I think, other than EDH. Like, that's that's the bottom line, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both of you. I, I don't think there's really any indication that modern could suffer because of this, or Modo for that matter. I think that even though, Dave, you're like, I'd be shocked if you were, were wrong, right? Like, there's no way that Modo has the same player base that Arena does. But I think the difference between them is that Arena likely has a rotating player base of people who engage with magic almost as a mobile game or just a very casual free-to-play video game whereas if you're playing moto you a have to pay 10 bucks to like get in and b because of the way their economy works and it mirrors paper it has a much more enfranchised player base where the retention rate is likely much higher whereas i think a lot of people on arena like maybe they download the app play it for a week you know, they hit gold and then they start playing meta decks and they're like, I don't think this is actually fun. And right. I'll just stick to Hearthstone or something else. Or, you know, Subway Run. Yeah. What's a, what's a popular phone game? But Sp- Doodle. Texting. Twitter. That's a good phone game. For the olds. Missed. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it is it is a bummer. I hope that they figure something else on Arena that we can use as a paper, an internal paper format. Like that, I don't know what it is. Figure it out. Make something for me. That's that's what I want. Make something for me. Do you want you want my potential hot take here? That's what we're here for. You know, we're known for our hot takes. I wouldn't be surprised if they roll back that it's going to be an historic. I wouldn't. I've thought about this today. I I wouldn't be surprised that they're just like, okay, fine, play with the original cards. I mean, there's been a lot of a lot of people upset about this in the context of historic on media. So. Right, right, and there's been a very clear distinction in the standard reaction and the historic reaction too. I, yep. I've seen a lot of enfranchised standard players say that this is a positive, and a lot of enfranchised historic players, including those in our community and just people in podcasts and on Twitter, who agree that this is a problem for historic. Yeah, the Reddit, the Reddit thread was like, I think both volatile and reasonable. <laughs> like I've seen a few Reddit threads where like you know, why is this bad for historic? And then a lot of people's replies just be like, this is why like X, Y, and Z. And like, it makes me want to not keep giving money to them. It's just like, I mean, we hear this every time there's any change to arena, but like, I think this is, this is a big one. Yeah. So, I mean, we spent a lot of time on this. I think it's, it's, it's uh, not overly fair to uh, Mickey S to spend, to, to talk about the death of historic (laughs) on this historic episode. So why don't we head into the dive down? to talk about the uh, Innistrad Championship that was a split format, standard, and historic, and then talk about our experiences playing, I think, a lot of uh, Best of One historic. So stay with us. All right, we are back. And first off, like we mentioned, we want to talk about some fun and good historic experiences in the Innistrad Championship. And there were 252 players who came to compete in a split format, Arena Set Championship. I honestly don't know how you qualify for this. <laughs> Several different ways. I'm sure people did really well uh, to, to get there. So congrats to all 252 of you. There were seven rounds of historic and eight rounds of standard across two days of competition. Again, as I just made pretty clear, I guess, it's a split format. So it doesn't give us a huge insight into the historic metagame, but we're not really here to analyze the historic metagame because it's all going to get blown up on the 9th of December with uh, the release of Alchemy. Is that Thursday? <sighs> yeah, it's going to be like when <laughs> the day after this pod comes out if we're on our typical schedule. Okay. So, um, but it's going to be worth, I think it's worth looking at this as like kind of a final send off to our digital format friend and see what people were selecting uh, in best of three historic metagame. We, so we have the historic metagame broken down, and I'll just go through that really fast. And we have uh, Selesnya Humans at 16% of the field. Is it Phoenix was 13.5. Heliod Company sort of combo, life gain combo, 10.3. Golgari Food, Sacrifice, 8.3. And then Just Guy Control at 7.1. Then there was a, a few other decks like at 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Uh, decks you know like Jun Food, Ractos Arcanist, Jun Citadel, Is It Epiphany, Is It Creativity. But then 23% other. So this is pretty cool. Like the, the biggest deck in the field is only 16%. Uh, only three decks above 10%. And so that's that's pretty cool. Like uh, 
we've seen much different percentages in previous historic metagames and these kind of pro level or a, you know highly competitive level tournaments. So uh, I think we can say historic's in a pretty decent spot. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's interesting. I think the the it's it's interesting to see the pros level of engagement with historic as a format. I'm not sure it was clear like how many people that were in this event really really love historic as a format. Yeah, yeah. But seeing this list of decks, I mean, as someone who hadn't checked in on the historic meta lately, was pretty pretty interesting to go. Oh, we have two collect company decks basically at the top out of the top three and then is phoenix is still hanging out there and food is still hanging around but they've kind of evolved to where they don't need red anymore i think it's pretty pretty cool ravenous squirrel what a card right if you played against that much it's a pretty cool card yeah like gogari food i mean i do want to talk about some of these because there are some new decks i think since we even last really talked about this format like slicing humans sure it's a green white sort of vaguely modern-ish humans deck it's, a, it's aggressive and disruptive, taxes the opponents, tries to apply consistent pressure, sure. Is it Phoenix? Pretty darn similar. It gets to play the, one of the best spells of all time in Faithless Looting. It's got a blue sideboard, so you know pros love that. But I think we get some new stuff, like with Heliod Company, which, like you said, Dave, is using uh, Scurry Oak and Heliod and Life Gain creatures, like what the, the Innkeeper, along with old classic, uh, what is that? Want white soul warden yes 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 so many soul wardens innkeeper is just a redundant soul warden but we'll exactly. probably talk about more about that in the second part of the dive yeah i mean that's you know creatures can get really huge they can get really you can go really wide you can just gain a zillion life so that's that's that deck but golgari food i think is pretty cool like, yeah it's like it's really different in a lot of ways than the former sacrifice decks of your like it just has a lot of new tools and like combo elements, like it has the Ravenous Squirrel from Horizons 2 that is now in through Jumpstart, now in Historic. It's got Deadly Dispute and Shambling Ghast from uh, Forgotten Realms. Mm-hmm. It has Meat Hook Massacre from Midnight Hunt, a card that we we did call as being good. And man, do I hate seeing that card. Oof, cast that card's me. brutal. It's so brutal. And this focuses like on these sacrifice loops and engines and payoffs to potentially grow a huge ravenous squirrel. You can drain, gain your opponent with massacre triggers. You can draw a bunch of cards with deadly dispute and village rights. Village rights, still good. Uh, maintain your life total, all that usual annoying sacrifice stuff that you've seen before, just kind of in a different package. And it's pretty efficient, pretty darn good. And then Jeskai Guy Control. I mean, they, Epiphany and Creativity were listed separately, so I'm just going to assume this is uh, Spike, Spikey's uh, Just Guy Control. Pros love it, pros play it. People want to play Shark ty- Typhoon and Teferi uh, Hero of Dominaria, and we're going to let them. Right on. So, I mean, we can't really break down the meta much more. There's no real reason to, but we did get the top eight, right? Yep. So, top eight, first seed on Selesnia Humans, Christian Hauk. You know, nothing too different about this one from my understanding, but it's playing Hamlet Vanguard, which is kind of a newer card from Crimson Val. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure frequently the only other reason to be green in the main was for Coco, and Hamlet is now this new green human threat that gets big. Yeah, I I did. I will kind of do a little bit of a spoiler. I did play a lot of Slesian Humans this week, but I did not play a Hamlet Vanguard version. So intriguing card that uh, I'm interested in. Yeah. Second seed going in the top eight or second in our list was Toro Saito on Golgari Food. We talked a little bit about this already, but uh, Ravenous Squirrel is a a strong one drop that I think is worth keeping an eye on. Um, You know, one drops are always that have that much tax time and are always worth uh, keeping an eye on for sure. And they have crafted this deck to make it into a good threat. Yeah. It kind of replaces the Mayhem Devil here as your way to get additional value out of your food, cat food loop. Mm-hmm. So where Mayhem Devil used to ping opponents for your cat food cat loop, cat oven, that's the one. You know, Ravenous Squirrel instead becomes very big. Yeah. There were two other players in the top eight on Golgari Food, Riku Kum- Kumagai and Yuki Ishikawa, uh, who was the winner of the event, was piloting Golgari Food as well. Mm-hmm. Fourth seed going into this was, uh, is it Phoenix with Zachary Klein, or Kine? Pretty stock, uh, Sprite Dragon in the two slot and a couple of Stormwing Entities, which you don't always see anymore. Yeah. Another interesting tech in Zachary's sideboard was to Svielin, the legendary merfolk from MH2. Huh. Yeah. What's that all about? I don't know. Just like maybe against like decks where like once it gets, if you stick it and protect it, it can draw you a bunch of cards. Type right. Thing. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe, maybe in other creature matchups or if you don't have to face a ton of removal because it's never 
indestructible. Yeah, interesting card. Uh, fifth place was another Is It Phoenix player, Simon Gortzen, was who uh, got second place. Delver in this list for Delver as the as the third threat in the deck. So this uh, I actually played this a little bit. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but it was Dragon's Rage Channeler, Delver, and Phoenix are the threats in this deck. Oh, and Ox of Agonis. I mean, I know, I know. I know a lot of these names we hear uh, over and over and over again, but I, I do have to just, I have to shout out Simon Gerson for like just staying in this game for so long, right? Like he, I think he did like a, he won a pro tour or like he did something like a long time ago. Like he sort of planted his flag and then he did commentary for a while and he's been in a lot of these arena based championships. So shout out to Simon for just killing it for a really long time. Thanks Shane. I, I, I'll, I'll thank you on behalf of Simon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pass that on to him. I'm tweeting at him right now. Hang on. <laughs> uh, sixth place, another is a Phoenix list with, oh, Yuta Takahashi. <laughs> an- another name you may have heard uh, in your your magic history. So three is it Phoenix and three Golgari food in this top eight. <sighs> Goodness. Uh, yeah, because seventh place was uh, Riku Kumagai on Golgari food. And then our eighth place list was Yo Akaiki on Jeskai Creativity. There you go. I don't know much about this deck. What's it look like to you? So this is basically a Indomitable Creativity combo deck where you're trying to get Sarah's Emissary out or you have some alternative threats in the sideboard. You can sometimes do the Mizzix Mastery Magma Opus combo. It's kind of what we've seen different iterations of Indomitable Creativity as play a big creature that more or less locks your opponent out of the game. Sweet. And yeah, like you said, we had uh, Yuchi Ichikawa Yuki Ichikawa, excuse me, uh, the Golgari food list as the winner. So congrats to them. And it's a fine send off to our historic format as we know it, at least for now, maybe by next week, everything we said is already going to be changed. Who knows? That's right. And I think the thing that's interesting about this is that these decks look like decks that we expect from historic, right? Like, is it Phoenix is there? There's a sacrifice deck. There's a good creaturey collected company deck. There's a creativity deck, a Jeskai control plus combo, but a lot of Jeskai control. So this metagame makes a lot of sense. This is the best of three metagame. Mm-hmm. So how do we think that changes when we take a look at best of one historic? Ooh, I mean, in some ways, it's just top line. We can get oh, deeper okay. into it later. So a couple of, couple of thoughts before we get in. Uh I guess it's. I think it's maybe fun to talk about this now before we get maybe like this before we talk about all of our decks. I think it might be fun to talk a little bit about yeah, like you said, Dave. Is what's the big difference here? And for me, I honestly think it's that best of one is more exploitable in different ways, and that could either be your the hand smoother algorithm that gives you kind of a, a better spell to land balance more frequently than best of three does. It could be the fact that you don't face sideboard cards unless people are running them main deck. And very frequently you will see traditional sideboard cards in main decks. And so I, what I, the way I look at best of one is how do I plan on winning a single game of magic in the most proactive for me, at least is how do I win a game with a game plan that I expect someone to not be able to disrupt. And I, I, and I kind of see best of one as more exploitable in that fashion because people can't plan for what you might be doing. Right. Or they can only plan for certain really well-known strategies, right? Like people can yeah. sneak in hate cards for certain things, but it's hard to do that. So you, you get this kind of everybody's, it's a little bit like a lot of people are shooting for two ships passing in the night kind of magic. And then occasionally you just crash into each other and have to figure out what you're supposed to do about it. I think that's a really good metaphor is like every, you know, every once in a while you just steamroll someone or they weren't prepared for what you were doing. Every once in a while you get to a a state where you have to make some important decisions. And every once in a while you get steamrolled because Mm -hmm. you weren't prepared for what they were doing. Yeah. Sometimes you steamroll someone. Sometimes the steam rolls you. I think you actually hit the nail on the head. The one thing I didn't hear you say is that I believe the, Best of one metagame in the latter, especially, which is really what we were focused on. We weren't doing events, is more about game quantities and trying to run out as many games as possible for perhaps a singular purpose of climbing the ladder. Whereas a the best of three metagame and, and what we see in this players tour is more about outplaying opponents and having, you know, perhaps more decision-driven gameplay. It's interesting that you say that, though, because the math on climbing is that best of one is better 
until you get to platinum and then best of three is better technically so that's at like 55 percent 60 percent win rates you're better off doing best of three than best of one right so what that but the games take longer sure and i think what that math does not account for is time spent where i think if you have a positive win rate with the proactive deck you can play more best of one matches than best of three matches so i think i think you can actually net out a little bit more equal than people may give it credit for for sure i think in what you're really getting to stan i agree with is the important point is that you can do either and i think it depends on your mindset about the kind of games you want to play and perhaps your goal like i think that if you want to be like like we just talked about in historic which is we want to emulate paper play more closely then honestly i think you're better off doing best of three because it's more like quote-unquote real magic but i think that one of the reasons we're looking at best of one is one mickey has asked us to and two it is a legitimate way that many people do play arena because maybe they only have five six minutes and this i want to bust out one one or two games they don't want to get stuck in a 30 minute control you know matchup where they're just like well i I can I, if I scoop, I lose two pips or something like that. And it's just like, I just want to play some fast games and get out of here. Well, and also, I think that there's a lot of people on Arena who this is just their level of engagement with Magic, right? Is like Stan was saying, it's a digital game. They break it out, they play something along the lines of cards I have dot mm-hmm. deck, which I think contributes to some of the decks you see in, in historic best of one a lot and uh, kind of go from there. Right, on. I think it's important to preface what we're. I mean, we're talking about best of one, and we played a lot of best of one. And I don't think any of us are super negative about the experience in any real way. So I don't want it to sound like we're more judgmental on it versus best of three. I just think it's a different way, and that's it's something that's very real to talk about, and that's why we're doing it. So, any other big takeaways about the differences of best of one before we get into the decks, or do we want to talk about any of the? You know, we talked a little bit about the exploit nature of the meta what do you think the major accesses of exploiting the mechanics of best of one are so you talked about the smoother are there any kind of like deck archetypes that we should talk about before we go deeper in before we talk about what we actually played because one is life game <laughs> dot deck is something you see all the time that people love in here stan stan you, i mean you played some life game right yeah i played look guys i played a lot of historic decks not only for this episode yeah. but in general even though modern is still my favorite format, historic is my favorite thing to do on my cell phone when I'm not doom scrolling. It's great company in the bathroom. But one of the decks I did play was the Selesnia combo with scroll, Scurry Oak, um, which has a life gain axis. It's not the Angel's life gain deck, though, where you're sometimes just like triggering, you know, four, four, and five, five flyers and gaining, you know, 10 plus life per turn. But you do have an infinite life combo that is, you know, central to your primary one condition yeah Ange- angels is f- much fallen off the map i think at this point with some of the new additions we have to the life gain decks i feel like i see angels much less often than i see like the heliod style decks or even things like uh, uh clerics which i think like the black white orzov clerics deck i saw a lot of i saw just straight up a johnny's pride might mate which i guess might be in the black white decks now too but sometimes i just see white cats yeah People love life gain, like love, 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 love soul warden. I saw so many turn one soul wardens. Now, do you think this is because of affinity for the card that this is a beloved card for players? Or do you think that there's something about life gain in the best of one ladder that actually helps you exploit the format where you can both be super proactive while potentially buffering your life total against other aggressive decks? Yeah, I think there's not a lot of great ways for people to stop life gain and life gain combos in historic. Like it's just gonna you're gonna stop any creature deck by and large that doesn't have some kind of anti life gain tech. And you're what you're gonna be weak to maybe sweepers if you don't plan to rebuild creatively and successfully, right? That's about it. So yeah, I think it's one of those axes that we're talking about, which is like here is a proactive and hard to stop strategy, and and people are gonna people try to exploit that. All right, so life gain, that's a big one. If, if you're going to play Historic, you're either going to play against it or you're going to play with it. Maybe both. Mirror matches do happen. Well, how do you feel about that deck? It let me hit Mythic really quickly in November, 
I hit Mythic on Thanksgiving Day, actually, after switching to Scurry Oak, like, <laughs> two or three days prior. Um, just because it's both really proactive, people, I think, are pretty good to scooping to the infinite life combo. Um, there are outs to it still. You know, sometimes people can lock you out of the game with Enchantress, I think is a deck we'll talk about in a little bit, where maybe you have infinite life, but you can't actually ever beat your opponent. You are still vulnerable to sweepers. And sometimes a well-timed sweeper will be enough for someone to claw back because, you know, like the Heliod combo in Modern on MTGO, it is a lot of clicking. You can't do a loop that automates it for you, and it can be pretty tedious. And I once even had a mirror match where it was, I'm on Scurry Oak, my opponent's on Scurry Oak, and we both clocked out of the, like, the timer because we were just comboing off for so long, and it was basically who can make the most squirrels before their rope ran out was partially how the <laughs> game was determined. Hmm. It's a draw. Yeah. Great game. So yeah, deck is good. Super vulnerable to control or removal heavy strategies because, you know, answering all of your soul wardens will sometimes do it. Even, even though yeah. you have alternate win cons, you know, with your moon dancer or that new card, Voice of the Blessed from Crimson Vow. Oh, yeah. So it's all a lot of those. On yeah. Ladder. Sometimes you can make a super big threat that doesn't necessarily get bigger because of your combo, but you are gaining life incidentally. But you generally have the primary goal of hitting the combo. I liked it. Deck is good. It helped me hit Mythic. End of story. Stan, what else did you, did you, uh, did you get into? Well, you know, I've been playing elves forever. Yeah, you're an elf man. And I actually think, I think elves is still solid and historic. And I think that's another pinnacle of the best of one format that's just worth talking about in general. Like, I play against elves a ton. I, yeah. I think next, so next many to elves. Life Gain Angels, elves, I believe, might be the most popular deck I face. For sure. People love dumping their hand, turning the, them into a bunch of buffed creatures, and then swinging in. Um, I definitely lost to this deck one time where it was like really close. I almost got there and then they played three more <laughs> threats and that was that was kind of you know, it. Warmaster is just a busted card. Like Warmaster, I think, is actually the card I fear most. Just because it makes so many creatures. Yeah, Warmaster is definitely a problem for people who don't have removal. Stan, I still have a I still have a foil one here for you if you want it just to staple up on your wall next to your favorite cards. Dude, I told you I will take it from you, but I'm not trading you or giving you any money for it. Oh. But if you give it to me, I will put it in a commander deck. No, it's for you. All right. I'll I'll give it to you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the thing that's unique about elves that makes it such a resilient deck for so long is that it can win out of nowhere from a bunch of different positions where even though your primary win con is to swing for lethal, often with a super wide board, you have different tools to do that, either because of collected company or you can sometimes pump your creatures for 10 power and trample with Crater Hoof. Or sometimes your Allosaurus Shepherd is going to make all of your creatures 6-6s six or 7-7s, seven sevens, depending on how many lords you have. Or you have like a Merwin with like 10 counters on it uh -huh. and you like use all the mana to use the War Master uh trigger or excuse me the war master activated ability yeah so many so many ways to win yeah elves is really good Mo it's basically always mono green these days you know sometimes in the best of three ladder you might encounter a green black version for some sideboard cards or thought seizes but generally speaking in best of one it's it's a mono green deck and i think maybe as long as i mentioned that i just want to point out the best of one ladder is rife with mono colored decks for a number of reasons some I think may be budget, others may actually be strategy. But you know, if you're only interested in playing your favorite blue deck or your favorite red deck, you can actually sometimes get by with that in best of one, especially. So elves, still good, still good, <laughs> okay, cool. especially in best of one. Yeah, uh, yeah. You want me to keep going through these decks I played? Because I yeah, let's go through decks that that Stan played. Sure. Um, I'll, I will still play shamans from time to time, which is a red green deck. It's I think. Probably the most popular red-green aggro deck right now. You don't see the old Questing Beast red-green aggro decks. Yeah, Gruel, Gruel aggro is pretty off the map. Yeah, but Shamans is around. I, I'm suspecting you guys probably faced it down at some point. I, I am not familiar with this deck at all, so... I only did today, after like 70 matches. I saw it right before we were recording this episode, actually. Yeah. So the key difference between this and traditional Gruul Aggro, it's very synergistic. It almost has a little built-in combo. 
And the point of this deck is to set up a, you know, semi-specific win condition using Harmonic Prodigy, which is an MH2 card, and Rage Forger, which is like a Lorowin card that they put into, I think, some supplementary set. Anthology, yeah. Who knows? And with this deck, what you typically do is turn a board full of really cheap creatures into this one-shot explosive win out of nowhere position using the Rage Forger triggers that double up because of Harmonic Prodigy. And the really neat thing about this that I don't think any other deck does among the aggro strategies in the format is that you can sometimes win without actually connecting for lethal damage because you'll swing with a bunch of bodies that have counters on them and then Rage Forger triggers will just like ping your opponent for 10, 15 damage. That happened to me for sure. And then the last deck that I would say that I played a lot is Is It Phoenix. And the version that I was really interested in lately is the one that's using Smoldering Egg as its secondary threat, which is another newer card from one of the last two Innistrad sets that kind of reminds me of Thing in the Ice, where right. instead of upheaval, <laughs> I mean, it's not Thing in the Ice, <laughs> but it rewards you for playing a bunch of spells and then creates this like... Seven spells, in fact. So it's not seven spells, it's seven mana worth of instants and sorceries. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah, that counts. Yeah, so you only need to play four expressive iterations. <laughs> What a card. Which is the exact amount that you typically have in your deck. Stan, I gotta ask, what were your thoughts on Is It Phoenix in the best of one meta? I never felt like it was doing anything amazing that was like, man, I just this is such a good best of one deck. No one can possibly stop it. Yeah. So while I agree that it's not perhaps as broken as the three other strategies that I encountered, Shamans being the least broken of, of them. I think what's really interesting about Phoenix is that because the birds are recursive and because you have a lot of redundancy and expressive iteration and other cantrips, Phoenix is the deck that will most likely help me win from behind. Whereas I may be in an unfavorable ward position or my opponent's been interacting with me and sometimes I'll just have one really good draw that I can just chain out of nowhere maybe flashback of Faithless Looting, maybe escape an Ox of Agonis. And then all of a sudden I got, you know, a couple boards on the board, maybe another threat. And I'm just like back in the game or even winning on the spot when it looked like I was effectively dead. So I think the Phoenixes, they've got these talons. They can claw back really well. Because. But they're not necessarily doing what perhaps elves or these life gain strategies are, which is doing something really... Uh, acutely powerful and super proactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. makes it hard for your opponent to come back from. So, how's your month going this month? I know you made Mythic in November. How's your early December going? I know it's only the fifth, but I've been I've been grinding. I've been grinding some games. How about you? Oh, I've been grinding. You know, one of the things that I like about Arena, and this is the if- notice he didn't answer the question, Dave, about where he's where I'm, he's I'm, at. I'm, I'm 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 getting to the answer. You know, I can't just answer okay. it simply. No one wants to hear. I mean, he's in plaid because he's a was... mythic one, baby. <laughs> no, I, I'm not a mythic currently. Um, I'm I'm somewhere in platinum. I've been playing less arena because I've been playing more modern for uh, paper prep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing about arena that I love that has helped keep me engaged in historic is the dailies are kind of fun. You know, it doesn't take too long to hit them. You generate your in-game currency. You can ladder while doing that especially if you have several decks in a bunch of different Mm -hmm. colors and that's kind of how i was in after i hit mythic in november because i kind of went all in knowing that we were going to make this episode i felt like i got a lot of testing i sort of staked my claim on the format and from there i just figured i can be a little bit more passive because yeah you're not trying to do 1200 top 1200 stuff so yeah, I'm 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 somewhere in platinum. I've been climb, climbing gradually, but I, I think to make mythic, you have to be pretty engaged. Yeah, you do. You have for to, sure. You have to play a you lot. You have to be willing to play, you know, more than just your dailies. And I have been playing kind of the minimal amount past my dailies of just kind of where I have like a few extra minutes, maybe like I'm trying to rock a baby to sleep. Yeah. I can't believe you play magic while you're trying to rock your kid to sleep, but I understand. <laughs> That's when I got really deep into podcasts. So he's four months old. He has nothing to say. <laughs> it seems hard to balance. That's all. <laughs> Misclicks must happen. Dave, how's uh, how's your testing going? You played a lot of different decks. Mm, I wouldn't say a lot. 
I definitely didn't play as much as you as you both did. I I played Phoenix Two, of course. How do you feel about it? Uh, I mean, I played Simon Gortzen's list from the the Pro Tour over the last few days, and I I think that the, one of the things I was going to say earlier that one of the things I think that's tough about Phoenix is that a lot of the decks that I think are good in historic, they either have like this overwhelming kind of snowball potential, or they have some kind of disruption in them. And I think Phoenix has a little bit of the snowball disruption, but none of the lists that I saw seem to run any kind of proactive, not proactive, any counter spells in the main quite often. There's only a few that I saw that had Archmage's charm, but it seemed like a lot of it that has kind of gone out of vogue in favor of just being more assertive. And I wonder if in best of one, you really should be trying to put together a Phoenix list that has some kind of counter spell in it, which I'm assuming is going to be Archmage's charm. Yeah. So I sourced my decks from untapped. Mm-hmm. I think in, in all cases, that's kind of where I get my best of one list. That's like your aqua list from. Yeah. Part of that is just because MTG goldfish doesn't have a good source of data. So Untapped, I think, is a little bit more on the pulse, and it—I mean, it's aggregating thousands of matches. Yeah, and, and and to that point, I'll just just to say, Dave, I was playing a list with Archmage's Charm, which I think mm-hmm. does pair well with Smoldering Egg because it's three mana. Yeah. It's a little awkward at times because if you ever have a you know a basic mountain, your Archmage's Charm isn't getting cast until turn four or later, right? It's cryptic command suddenly. Yeah. But I think that, so the list that I played was more kind of like all in on being good. And like, I, I just think that you, you want some interaction, some stack based interaction in Phoenix if you're going to play it in best of one. Um, the thing that's interesting to me about Phoenix too is it's one of the decks that runs into main deck hate that's hard to interact with for the deck. Like, if you're not running counter spells, there's, I played multiple against multiple decks that had uh, main deck Anger the Gods. Which was wow. unfortunate. Soul Guide Lantern, I see a lot just because it can cycle. Yeah, Con- the control decks play anger, right? I-, I feel like that's that's where I encounter it the most. Yeah, yeah, and so it hurts some decks a lot, but it really hurts Phoenix, of course, because if you get two birds out and a Dragon's Rage Channeler, they're like bye, <laughs> and it's really hard to, you know, not over extend the board into a uh, wrath. Like you have to play around it in such a different way because Phoenix sort of is all about overextending your board. Like, that's how it wins, right? You try to get three Phoenixes out at a time and just hit somebody for nine. So I thought that it was okay. I ran into main deck Graft Digger's Cage a couple of times, and, you know. So I do think that it's uniquely susceptible to cards that people feel okay, ru- sideboard cards that people feel okay running in best of one in their in their decks, which is unfortunate and maybe takes a little bit away from Phoenix. But it's it's there. People love playing it. It's part of, I think it's one of them, I'm sure it's one of the most popular decks, even in best of one historic. Um, and then other than Phoenix, I went back to my old favorite historic deck, which is Auras. Still so good, I think. I think it's actually pretty good in best of one as well. And there's even a couple of different flavors floating around. Now, I if, you know, I was really into blue-white auras, and I'll talk about that in a little bit about before, um, you know, last year, earlier this year, things like that. But I, I think I had the most success with uh, Obzon auras this time, and I thought that was pretty interesting. Because Auras has really evolved a lot. So one of the main things that's happened to both of these Auras decks is that they have options to be able to run three different Enchantress, quote-unquote, creatures in the deck. And so the Obzon one gets to run um, gets to run Core Spirit Dancer, SRAM, and also Sithis Harvest Hand from, from Modern Horizons 2. So you get to decide how many of these creatures that have that whenever you cast an enchantment, draw a card effect on them you want. And I think that, you know, the Obzon deck that I was playing had 10. It had four Core Spirit Dancers, three Srams, and three Sithis. And Sithis is nice too because it gives you some incidental life gain, which can help you in the more aggressive matchups uh, to be able to buy some time if you start chaining off a whole lot of auras. So it's nice that that one has an extra dimension to it as well. You know, it still plays on the that your primary black-white game plan, though, which is hand disruption, auras that don't necessarily buff but pr- provide a lot of resilience to your creatures. Kaya's Ghost Form is still a lot better than I generally thought it was the first couple times I looked at it. Like, there's nothing like having somebody have to wrath in order to get rid of your your core spirit dancer that has Ghost Form on it. So just have it come back and then you drop some new stuff on it. Um, the other thing that I really liked about this green deck is that it does not try to give things flying. It does have an angelic gift, which you know gives things flying, but 
there are a couple of options in here that run uh, give creatures in this deck trample, including the rune from uh, I forget the rune from Kaldheim, but also a card from AFR called Wild Shape, and that card I think is really good in auras, especially in a best of one context because it buffs your creature's size, which comes off really infrequently. Uh, I'm just going to read Wild Shape in case people don't know what it does because I think it's a cool card that people should keep in mind four decks like this. So Wild Shape says, choose one. It costs one green, a single green. Until end of turn, target creature you control has the base power and toughness, becomes that creature tight, and gains that ability of below. A 1-3 turtle with hexproof, a 1-5 spider with reach, or a 3-3 elephant with trample. So the thing uh, is, trample. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The thing that this lets you do is have a card in your deck that really is offensive or defensive. That lets you protect your creature if you have to, but later on in the game, if you draw it and you're in a good position, you can use it to, to kill. And so there's only one in the deck that I had. I kind of feel like I would like to have another one of those, but it was just a nice reason to kind of continue to dip into green a little bit with Sithis, because those are really the only green cards that you're running. The um, I was running the rune from Kaldheim that's green that draws a card and gives Trample, Wild Shape, and Sithis. Did you guys play against this deck at all? Uh, not in a long time. N- no, only only Azorius auras. Interesting. Yeah, I don't I think I really th- saw much of any auras in any of our prep for this episode. To be honest. Hmm. 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 Well, why don't we talk about blue uh, blue white auras for a yeah, minute? Yeah, I've too. I've been seeing more of that, especially as I get higher on the ranks. Honestly, because I think it's a good deck. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good deck too. I like the disruption that the that the Obzon one has with. Thought season, everything, but the blue white deck, of course, it's fast, it's strong, it makes a big creature really quickly, and unless you draw a crazy amount of cards. Um, and the main thing with this one is that it also has an option for a third uh, draw card creature, and that is Storm Chaser Drake, which we talked about on the spoiler episode. 2 1 flyer for a generic and a blue with heroic draw card. Um, four Pro Tour competitors brought blue-white auras to the PT. I don't think too many, I don't think any of them did particularly well, but um, it was interesting for me to see that four people had picked it up and brought it, and they all had, uh, I believe they all had Storm Tracer Drake in them. Um, And it's great. You know, it's great because it's a card that lets you drop a bunch of auras onto something that already has flying, which is one of the things that you were often trying to do, trying to find some kind of evasion. To why Mm -hmm. I liked green in the Obson deck, to why this one is, is, I think, helpful now and has some extra push to it. Um, it's kind of bad that you have to, to really get the full extent of it, you have to keep, um, casting auras on the same creature over and over again, you know, which with core spirit dancer and SRAM, you don't really have to, you can cast on something else occasionally if you need to and still get the draw triggers. But, um, you know, it's got flying, it's there for you to buff and and kind of go for it. You know, the best case that you get to is where you kind of want to go you know, get it up to like a six six and then protect it for a couple of turns and leave it. So you don't it's nice that you don't have to make a giant like ten eleven uh spirit dancer in order to to win with this deck anymore. Yeah, I mean they're they're particularly good, right? Against like opposing creature decks, I just have a really hard time unless they all unless they have like unconditional style removal, like red decks just have they really can't win against auras, I feel like, unless they have some weird alternate game plan yeah i mean one of the other components of auras is that you make a big creature that gets lifelink and gain yes gain a bunch of life with it. And so it's it's like boggles from modern in that way where red decks really do have a hard time because all of a sudden you'll swing for a 12 12 with life lifelink and it's just kind of like whatever happens happens yeah you know in terms of the nature of the metagame that we sort of started laying out at the beginning of the section did you feel like auras was interacting with the format in a meaningful way i mean i think it interacts in the same way that your kind of like base life gain deck does you know where it's kind of like i'm gonna make some big threats fast try to win a, a resources war and then just kind of kill you with one big swing and so sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not that great but i think it does okay against other creature decks that like shane was saying that try to go wide or something because you don't really care that much and especially once you get a flyer up or once you get a trample threat up um you can kind of attack through a pretty wide board on your opponent's side and you have the tools to kind of wait them out a little bit as well the harder stuff of course is combo 
like combo decks just kind of destroy you. And then the the other thing is that control can be tough, but sometimes you can play around it. I think that these decks fit best in one pretty well because they kind of have that disruptive plus large threat idea. Um, in the case of blue white, it's a little bit of control magic plus stuff like Karamatra's Blessing to protect your cards. In the case of Obzon, you get to play um, things that give your cards hexproof or hand disruption, and so you kind of have those two two pieces. Yeah, I mean, I think. Auras is a good deck. Um, I fear it more than I do Phoenix, but it's also the style of decks that I've been playing. Mm -hmm. So I started in November, because I knew we were doing this episode, I started playing a lot of Historic, for me especially. And I started with Green White Humans. And I think I was down in Silver at the time, just because I had sort of been not engaging with Historic, because we've been doing so much with Modern lately. And Celestia Humans took me into Plat just by itself it's not it's not really an achievement to go from silver to plat of course but i uh was, was starting pretty down low and soliciting humans in best of one is just like i was saying earlier like it's aggressive and disruptive like you want to try to get under controlling in combo decks or go wide enough against removal heavy decks or like go tall enough to go over the top of other creature decks and it does all those things pretty well like i think it's its primary issue is that it runs really light interaction and so you really can't stabilize very well in the face of like elves or goblins or stop life gain decks like Heliod very effectively. Like there's no way I think in the deck to even stop life gain. So you can just, you know, they can just gain a lot of life against you. And that's, and life gain is such an incredibly popular archetype on the best of one ladder that I felt like that was a pretty significant issue. I did really like Adeline Resplendent Cathar as a newer three drop that pumps out humans on any attack. Like, you know, she's basically the human's Bramaz, but she doesn't need to attack. Like, any human that does triggers her. And, you know, she's strong and she even like pumps Thalia's lieutenant, which can trick people. Uh, where you're just like, I'm swinging and Thalia's lieutenant is triggering because of this human I just made from Adeline. And so that's pretty cool. Um, I think it's a overall, I mean, I think Celestia humans, even in best of one, is very strong and very good, but I think it's pretty soft to a few things that I think are pretty popular. Uh, and But I still think it's a perfectly good choice. I think you're going to win more than 50% of your matches, for sure. Isn't it interesting that Historic Humans doesn't play Meddling Mage, even though that is Historic Legal? Like I mean, it's it's green white and that's blue white, so you have to like stretch your mana in a different way. Yeah, and I or, think or, the, or just the build green, the deck differently in theory, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the green white mana is pretty clean and and you're really only splashing like collected company and potentially uh some green creatures maybe after the the set championship data but yeah i mean i think it is interesting right like especially in best of one because you'd be like this could be lights out against you know, you're not getting your key card that you need to really win the game uh but i do know that white humans was is pretty popular and so to see the differences, I switched over to mono white humans. And the primary thing that this offers you is faceless haven. Like, and that's just a really incredible hedge against board wipes, which are an issue, of course, for creature based decks, even ones with some disruption in them. So you lose collected company, but the mana is even smoother. Um, for whatever reason, the popular builds of this deck that were on uh, untapped don't run Adeline. And I think. I think they really should, because I think it's a really good card. Uh, I did like the moderately toolbox aspect that this deck takes in a lot of builds. Like Ranger Captain gets you a one drop. And so you can get like Esper Sentinel for taxing. You can get Three Abit Inspector for a redraw. You can get Giant Killer, like if they have a particularly powerful creature on the other side. You can even start tapping down their board if you get a number of Giant Killers. Like if you're just in a really long board stall scenario, typically you win those anyway just because you're growing your board with uh, either Thalia's Lieutenant Triggers or with the Luminarch. I believe that's the creature's name. I keep forgetting. Luminarch Aspirant. Yeah. And so like Aspirant just is growing your stuff every turn or the, the triggers from get, randomly top decking a Thalia's Lieutenant just sort of makes you bigger than most other creature decks over time. I climbed through gold with White Humans. I'm not sure I preferred it to Selesnia, but I did, of course, really like uh, Faceless Haven against 
control decks. And I think there's more control than there should be in best of one because people love control. And also as you get higher up, probably there's more of it too. It's, it's weird. Like I, I actually, I think I see better proactive decks now that I'm in high plat than I did kind of lower, but I think you do see kind of, you, you see a mix of different ranks anyway. Like you can see people's icon and like, even though, even though I'm in plat one, like I'm playing plat three and plat four players and stuff like that. So Shane, you know, you played a lot of modern humans and you mentioned that this historic version is not interactive, right? Modern humans is aggro disruption. This is a little bit more in just present threats, synergistic threats, right? Yeah. Get big tax your opponent. Does Playing the historic version scratch a similar itch, even though it has that different access. Like, would you say to people who like modern humans who may be interested in trying a historic strategy, like this is an act- an okay entry point? Not really, honestly. Like, you don't, you can't, you you can't be anywhere near as tricky because you don't have like Aether Vial. Uh, you don't have the the decisions like what do I reflector mage? What do I take? I mean, you do sort of have decisions similar to kite sail freebooter with your polos or it's like, what am I going to, what am I going to tax in their hand that, that makes it cost two mana more. I honestly don't, I honestly kind of really don't like Paulo's effect. I do like that. He is a three, one flyer that I can pump up. I think that the two mana is frequently very easy for opponents to catch up on, whether that's through a treasure token or through just making land drops it's like, oh yeah, this Wrath of God costs four and now it costs six, but I'm typically not racing you. Right. You're not quite that fast. Yeah, it's not that fast. Um, and so it's like, yeah, it's helpful, but it's not amazing. Yeah. But yeah, I mean I don't I honestly don't think it scratches a similar itch. I think it's base it feels like more like Merfolk. And there already is a Merfolk deck <laughs> where it's just <laughs> you know what I mean? It sounds a little like elves to me in some ways too, where it's like a wider but you have mana disruption from Thalia and Spellbinder. Yeah, that's it. It's the mana disruption. It's it's more like if you want a disruptive deck, it also, I think, it solidifies itself in a different way against opposing creature decks. Like Elves kind of gets a lot of lords. Right. And Humans gets a lot of counters. Right. And they both are doing similar things. Yeah. Uh, elves also has that big mana angle. Right. Where you do like a behemoth suddenly. That That's your, your thing you get to do. Yeah. Uh, one last question about Paolo. Slash spellbinder. Did you see the the extended border version in the store today? Uh, I already had it. All right, of course, I already had that. Nice. I, I guess I do think one thing that humans gets, and it, it honestly is just a white creature. It's actually not a human. Is you do get skycleave apparition, mm-hmm. and that yeah. that handles a lot of things. It handles massacres. It handles uh, Phoenix. Auras. Yeah, it handles everything. It handles yeah. a lot of good stuff. So, you know, Shane and Stan, we love buying fancy versions of cards in the store oh, yeah. for daily oh, deals. Yeah. Dave, do you ever do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have I have most of the like parallaxy of blue-white auras and a lot of Phoenix, too. I, I do like just the extended art ones. I don't buy the like Strixhaven versions and stuff like that, like the archives versions, but, but I like to. Yeah, good. I like to do cool things, too, guys. Good. I'm glad you got to do something with that gold. I also then okay so I got so then you gold. went for a big switch right? yeah then I'm like, like, tired of this yeah I was like I did humans I know what humans is I can talk about humans um, then I did briefly test a Chandra heavy red deck that went from like DRC at one to Cemetery Gatekeeper at two to a number of other like three and four mana threats specifically Chandra three and Chandra four and then topped out at Glorybringer at five and. While I like decks like this, sort of like a chonky red style thing, but it just felt like a deck that couldn't. This is this is a good example, I think, of a deck that cannot really handle the wild variants and swings and different kinds of decks and strategies you'll see in best of one. Because I really felt like it needed a side its sideboard elements to win in best of three. Like it needed anger of the gods, or mm-hmm. it needed different kinds of removal, and like it couldn't. It you or it's not going to be a combo deck like ever. Uh, and so I just like, I just shelved it um, after a few, a few matches. Cause it's like, this is not a best of one deck. I'm not feeling this, um, mm-hmm. but Sh- Shonda three feels cool. It does cool feel card. cool. Yeah. Cool card, bro. Um, so, but then I found, I saw a twit, a tweet um, from, I think our pal fire shoes um, of course. And this was a, a person who had made number one mythic, I think maybe like on the third of the month or something like that. And it's a, Red-based, mono-red-based aggressive deck, my favorite, 
uh, and it has features Torbrin. I, I love Torbrin. Interestingly, no uh, Embercleave. Mm, for what? even for yeah, no Embercleave, and I'll and, and I'll explain why I think because, and this has been my favorite and most successful deck of the season so far by far, and. It has a lot of pieces you'd expect, like Fanatical Firebrand and Robber of the Rich and Burning Tree Emissary and Bonecrusher Giant. But what I like about it is that I think it's really smartly built for the meta of best of one. It has seven anti-life gain cards, four Roiling Vortex main. That's Whoa. A bi- it's a big commitment to this card, but it just it does do a lot. And, and three Rampaging Ferocidon. I honestly think... In the best of one meta, you could run four main deck Ferocidon because life gain is just that popular. And Ferocidon's a perfectly good card. Like it has uh, Menace, which is sweet. It has sort of triggers against creatures entering the battlefield. That can be sweet. Uh, four Den of the Bugbear in a mono red deck. It's a great hedge against those control and board wipe style decks. It has four Ramanap Ruins for those finishing burn points. You know, there's so many times every mono red player will just tell you the good handful of games that they've won from a top deck Ramanap Ruins or just present that inevitable lethal of Ramanap Ruins where you see the opponent mouse over it and then they concede because it's like, oh right. crap. Yeah, I just can't. I can't beat that. Like, I have no way to interact with your land. Um, interestingly, I love Reckless Ringleader. Reckless Ringleader is one of those new digital-only cards and it's just a 1-1 one, one for 1 with haste and you select a creature in your card and perpetually give it haste. Mm. and what that really does is more more powerful than you might think like it really turns your creatures into two cards of value a lot more often where it's like a chain whirler coming in cleaning up a few x ones or just swinging in as an a three three first striker with haste or like rampaging ferocidon coming in with haste for three with menace uh, that can be a big game changer where it's like these creatures don't, you don't have to untap with them. Like they're doing something and swinging and you can be pretty surprising where it's like the opponent has to think about, well, what did they give haste? Did they give Torbrin haste? Did they give uh burning tramissary haste? Like what it, it makes the sequencing of your turns a lot more interesting than many decisions you had in red decks before. Like I'm often sitting there thinking, do I want to give my two drop haste to get more damage in quickly? Or do I want to sort of sit back and say, I want my three or even my four drops to have haste to be like a surprising thing in case they board wipe me. And I don't need to untap with Torbin to get four damage in, or I don't need to untap with uh, the Ferocidon to menace around for three or something like that. And those decisions I like a lot. And I think it just makes an aggressive deck even that much more aggressive at the same time. Chain Whirler, of course, MVP very often. Like, there's just so many games where I'm like, I need a third land. And this deck runs 24 of them, which is great because you want a lot of land in this deck. And I think it's very smart at saying, you're going to have stuff to do with your land. So I'm going to play 24, especially because the hand smoother makes it hard to flood out early on. (laughs) Yeah. Chain Whirler is just like, if I draw a third land, I'm winning this game and I'm going to clear out like these super important X ones, like the soul warden or the innkeeper or whatever. And, or just something that they're waiting to pump. Like it's like one of those creatures that grows with life gain or something like that. And it's like, I need, if I stop this now, I win. Or there's a lot of times when I do it after I have a Torbrin down and just wait till turn five and then chain whirler and then anger of gods, one sided anger of gods type thing. It's just, it's awesome. Uh, Torbrin of course is just a game winner. And I love the fact that the deck is smart enough to play 24 lands so that you're hitting Torbin reliably. Uh, it, and Torbin just makes those early game creatures into must blocks or good blockers. Ro- Roiling Vortex plus Torbin is dope. Three every turn instead of one every turn to your opponent. Just makes the... I've won many games with that. Like w- Just one or two Roiling Vortexes with Torbin makes the game... It's 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 a better Ramanap Ruins. Two. Two oh. roiling vortexes <laughs> with Torbrin. That would be yeah, just, yeah. just six damage a turn. That's pretty I rough. Mean, I, I mean, I won games where through being able to, to block with crappy creatures early on, like against like, you know, six, six creatures on the other side of the board. Right. Where it's like, if I'm if I draw a fourth land and I I can and just block for three turns, 
then I'm going to beat this opponent who's at 18 life. I have no burn. I have no ability to attack into them. All I'm doing is buying time to win with Rolling Vortex and Torbrin. And that happens. And it's super fun. <laughs> How important do you think it is to have a best of one deck that is somewhat gamed against the known best of one metagame? I think if you can do it without hurting your strategy, and that's what's good about this deck. That's, I think, a particular strength of this deck is like I'm playing anti life gain cards that are also damage. It's not like I'm playing rest in peace. Right. Do you know what I mean? Just like a I'm card not, that only is a sideboard card. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not playing a sideboard card main necessarily. I'm playing cards that are still on game plan. And I think it's a big strength of this deck is that I can play cards that stop the main thing that I want to stop, but still are very good. Like it's, it's rolling vortex is killer against control decks. It's, it's, it's killer if you stabilize and just need a few finishing points of damage. Uh, Rampaging for us on perfectly good creature. It does a lot of incidental damage. It has menace. It has three, it's three power. Great. Sweet. Perfect. It blocks well. It attacks well. I won, I think, 13 games straight with this deck. Through nice. Platinum, through Platinum 3 into Platinum and 2 into Platinum 1. Like I was, I've been trying to get into diamond today, but I'm running more average, which is of course bound to happen after 13 straight wins. So I'm just going to grind those out, but I'm, I'm still in plat one and I'm, I'm hoping to, to get it. I know that I'd be better off playing a best of three deck right now, but I'm just sort of being stubborn. I wanted to see what I can do in best of one in preparation for this episode. How many, how many games did you win in a row? 13. Is that a lot? It's. I mean, I will say that I didn't feel like I had a lot of particularly skillful wins. I was just running people over. I mean, there was a few games that was like, sweet, I won. Can't believe I pulled that off. But it was just like, this deck is running hot. Like, so many life gain decks where I'm like, like, I'm sometimes I just like felt it in my bones. I was just like, this is not an amazing hand, but if they're a life gain deck, they can't beat me. And it's like, turn one slow water, and I'm like, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about the meta overall. I think. Yes. Um, like, let's talk about what we played against, what we think strong right now, uh, what we think is potentially less good in best of one, perhaps. Yeah, there's a couple of decks that we haven't really mentioned that I know I encountered a lot, and I would frequently find that I just couldn't do anything about them. And the first one I'd love to throw out is the latest version of the Nine Lives combo, which is now a green-white oh, enchantress it's, deck. It's so good. So good. So for those unfamiliar, it's using nine lives, which basically prevents any damage. But, you know, this nine lives permanent gets counters instead of damage. But they pair that with Solemnity, which is another enchantment that prevents permanence from getting counters. So they essentially lock you out from ever being able to do lethal damage unless you happen to have, you know, just a handful of spells that are historic legal that say damage can't be prevented. I think Stomp is probably the most popular one of that ilk. <gasps> Ooh. What's new about this, you know, Enchantress version that got a couple upgrades from, what is it, like Historic Horizons, which had MH2 cards, is it has these other redundant Enchantress pieces that let that player not only have alternative win conditions, but just draw a ton of cards and get into their combo faster or have gameplay if they don't actually find their combo hold on your your nine lives combo opponent doesn't just snap keep every seven and just win on turn four through the through having both permanents well that's what happens for me every time they actually typically do but that's the hand smoother <laughs> i think huh. i mean i act, i didn't play against this but i was definitely waiting to run into it i was like i'm gonna hit this enchantress deck and i'm just gonna die because i don't think my deck is really good about it it's part of the reason i wanted to play something with thought seizes but I don't know how helpful that is because I know they can search up whatever piece with Sterling Grove, et cetera. But that's the thing is the, I mean, just the fact that the tool, a tool they want also tutors just bonkers. Yeah. I, I, when I played against that card in modern too, I've been like, why, why does this do this? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I think that's a top tier deck. I think it's really good. None of us played it, but I think that it's just, it's very hard to interact with some, like I can't even with red. Like uh, it's it's good to remember that I can actually get around it a little bit with stomp. I kind of forgot about that. There was I did have lines to win rather than scooping, but then they're they're sometimes pretty quick to lock things up overall. But can I mention one other deck that I was routinely impressed by and had a a, a really hard time beating unless I was on the scurry oak combo, and that was five color Nif to light. 
or it, it, mm. it's not live to life because it's not to have, light. Yeah. Don't have bring to light, but it's basically <laughs> not five color control with Niv Mizzet. And what I love about this deck is a, it has no trouble getting to five colors of mana because of triomes. B, there isn't a lot of really great land hate in the format. You know, you don't have Blood Moon, Alpine Moon doesn't cut it, Blood Sun doesn't cut it, Field of Ruin doesn't really cut it. But they have this super awesome Tarmogoyf called Territorial Kavu, which is just this super redundant, powerful, sticky early threat that can invade a ton of removal, except, you know, Fatal Push, basically. And also helps filter their hands. It has other trinket text. And it's like, they present this powerful early threat with Territorial Kavu, which is like a 4-4 or 5-5 as early as turn 2 because of the triomes, And then it helps sometimes let the games go long enough that then they just cast a Niv Mizzet and it's all over from there. Yeah. Yeah, I lost to that deck too. Seems like the best kind of option for a mid rangey kind of deck. You know, much has happened in, Pi- in uh, Modern for a minute there where that was like the best quote-unquote mid-range deck around because of the overwhelming card advantage off of Niv. Seems like you can you can groom it to do the same thing here. Yeah, I mean, I feel like after a bunch of matches, I feel like my 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 good best of one decks are like nine lives combo, various creature combo decks, like whether that's elves or auras or the life gain combo decks. I think all those are very good. And I think they have a game plan that, you can win with very often. I think the humans variants are also just good aggressive creature decks. I think Torben Red's really good just against the field right now. I mean, I think slightly less good ones are like the sack engine ones. I don't think they're I don't know why you would bring a sack deck necessarily into a best of one meta. I don't know why you'd I personally don't know why you'd bring Phoenix into a best of one meta. Speed there, but you redundancy. Know. Yeah. I just feel like other decks are doing what it's doing better. Like I want to kill you and I want to I want to filter through my deck, but it's just like I can kill you I can kill you with elves in 29 different ways. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean I mean at least with Phoenix, I'll just reiterate. The the thing that it does better than elves is sometimes it'll it'll come back. Come back. Fr- yes, exactly. Fr- from a poor position like elves will sometimes fold to removal. Phoenix can frequently outplay anything but graveyard hate, which is important. So do you guys have any final thoughts about like how can how should people get into best of one? Should people play best of one? Did you enjoy it? So I think top level, I'm okay with best of one existing. It was plenty fun. It was nice to not have to think about a match the whole time. It's never going to be what I do all the time. Dave, you just touched on something that is huge that I've, I've kind of wanted to bring up to you guys. Do you feel like best of one, though enjoyable, is a passive way to play magic? where it's kind of like who had the best opening hand, maybe the best first draw or two, as opposed to best of three formats, whether it's historic or or otherwise, where it's you can't really afford to be passive because the margin of error is a little thinner and you have to be able to really think about what your opponents are doing and sometimes outplay or outgrind. I don't know if I totally ag- agree with that particular angle on this, but I do think that, um, I think that, you get to be more in control of the play patterns you're expecting to have yes. in this because there's less, there's maybe, while there's a broader diversity of decks, they're doing similar things and you kind of, um, your options for interaction are limited because most of the decks aren't running that much. So you're kind of like, do I interact or not? No. Okay. I'm going to try to do my plan. Did it work? No. <laughs> okay. Then I'm dead. Or maybe you live. I think what I liked about it actually is I had to mulligan a lot less. I felt like I felt like I actually had more good game once. Like you know what I mean? Like it's it's the kind of thing where it's and not just because I won or something like that. I just felt like I I didn't go to like four cards like ever. You know what I mean? Like I just yeah. always had I always had like seven or six typically like pretty decent cards, and I was like I feel like and the hand smoothing helps a lot with that. I don't I don't agree that. It felt like more of the ship's passing in the night concept. I felt like I still had to play the game. I mean, there were plenty of games where I just, you know, cast whatever was the best card on my curve and, and won type thing. But there are plenty of games where I did feel like it was you know, pretty interactive and fun and dis- somewhat, you know, decision heavy and stuff like that. And those always felt good. But I, I did like not having to worry about like 
sometimes what what are my sideboard decisions here? But I think it does get old fast. I think especially as you get higher up the ladder where it's one pip either way. Like if you're trying the ladder and it's like one win is one pip, one loss is one pip. And that is actually, it takes a lot of time to move up the ladder. It takes a, a, a seriously long time. And I think you can get kind of old, like if that's your goal. If you want to ignore the ladder altogether and where you are on it, and you're just like, I just want a fast game that feels like magic. I think best of one is actually pretty fun. I think I get I think I get why people like it. I think I get why some people want to do it. It's time. Some people like to generate combos. They have a bit of a space here. Some people like to be able to just aggro people out. That has a space here. So I think um, you know, there's a real purity of the game where it's like, like you said, you don't have to a lot of branching decisions with a lot of these decks. It's kind of like, I'm gonna do my thing. Yeah. And then how how does best of one and historic compare to best of one flesh and blood, Shane? Oh, it's very different. I mean, Bl- Flesh and Blood is designed to be best of one and and therefore has a lot of things baked into it to make it be that game. Also, it, it, has, uh, it has a sideboard that you do before. So, like, you reveal who you're playing. Your champion. Yeah, you reveal yeah. your hero, and then you can add or remove X number of cards from, like, your pool of cards. So you can be like, okay... It would be like if I knew I was playing against control beforehand and could select like 13 cards of that I I felt like this is a – like, oh, they're, they're presenting Jengatha. <laughs> then, then it's a control opponent type thing. I mean, it would be like if you had a – yeah, a, maybe a, com- a commander that was revealed and could pre-sideboard. So I think that's something that Magic just can't do because of the way it's designed. It's designed as a best of three game, and no matter how many modal cards they add, uh, it's not going to make the game dramatically different. Um, than it was to make best of three. I think the I mean best of one the best way to play the game. But I do think that it's a it, it's a fun way and a different way to engage with it. Last question. I just want to ask: Would you guys appreciate best of one in any other formats that we play? I mean, you can't do it in modern. Like the idea of best in one in modern would be totally absurd, right? Because everybody would just play Charbelcher or a deck with force negation in it, and that that's all you would have. St- maybe Storm would be back. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Stuff that gets, you know, hated out, which it would just be even there's no no forces to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird that it's weird it's weird that it feels like it still can work in historic, even though a lot of the game plans and, and play patterns are similar. But modern just is just a definitely a different level of power. Well, there you have it, folks. That is our assessment of best of one historic. If you're hearing this, think about getting into the format. You may want to wait a day or two just to see how alchemy changes up the format because you never know if the deck that looks interesting to you might actually be a little worse in a week or two based on some of that early results and data and information that grinders might proliferate throughout the sphere of influence that is magic community at large but that said we had a really great time exploring this on behalf of our friend and citizen mickey s thank you again mickey for your ongoing support of the dive down for pitching us this fun and great idea thanks mickey Yeah, really motivating me to hit Mythic again, something my co-hosts have never done and probably never will. I've tried so hard. (laughs) I've hit Mythic. What are you talking about? I hit Mythic the first season I played. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Guess it's just Shane then. Before we close out, I do. it's interesting that before they announced Alchemy, uh, I did the bonus episode recording with the hosts of Bad End, and I think it was really prescient and related to what we're talking about this week and related to kind of the idea of alchemy and the way WotC is curating the game altogether. So if you haven't checked out the checked out the bonus episode, I would encourage you to. Uh, I thought it was a really good conversation, and th- thankfully because they were on it, I just I just had to sit there and ask a few questions. God, that's the best, right? Talk talkative guests, really. You are the MVPs in the world of podcasting. But that does wrap up this week's show. If you haven't yet. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as soon as they come out. And if you use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. If you'd like to submit a question to the podcast, you can tweet us at the dive down, all one word. You can email us, the dive down at gmail.com, or you can even leave an audio message for us at podinbox.com slash the dive down. If you'd like to support our show, you can join our Patreon. We're joining at any tier gets you into the Discord, but joining at the top tier gets you access to our time, and we will work with you to make a custom episode twice a year, not unlike this one. 
Shout out to ManaTraders for sponsoring the Dive Down. Sign up for ManaTraders using promo code the Dive Down 2021, all one word. Get 15% off your first two months of renting Magic Online cards. As always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Spaceblood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and play more. Oh!